Our nightmare began seven years ago. Had we known then the havoc that one man would wreak on our political, social, and cultural landscapes, I don't think we would have done anything different. After the initial shock of, the, of having lost the 2016 election, hundreds of thousands of people, just like us, decided that our country, our democracy, demanded that we take action rather than wring our hands in despair. And so grassroots organizations like Swing Left took root. I joined Swing Left for many reasons. Because I felt I had to do something I was compelled to. Because Swing Left's strategy is data-driven and focused. The goal is simple, help elect Democrats up and down the ballot. The tactics we use are time-tested and effective, and there's a little something there for everybody. There's organizing, fundraising, recruiting new members, and I know that some of you are new, so I'm hoping we can recruit you tonight. Registering new voters, writing letters and postcards, phone banking and text banking, and of course, knocking on doors. SLSGV decided to leverage our reach by partnering with other Swing Left chapters, including Inland Valley, Los Feliz, West Valley, and Maricopa County, Arizona. And some of their members are here tonight. Thank you so much for coming. We also partner with other organizations like Activate America, Northeast Arizona Native Democrats, and United Democratic HQ. Our efforts speak for themselves. Just look at the results of the 2020 election and the midterms in 2018 and 2020, the election of Judge Janet, what we accomplished in Ohio, and more. Boy, did it ever feel good to do something instead of fretting and wanting to pull my hair out. <laughs> Two other things helped galvanize my anxiety into action. Today's edition newsletter, and chop wood ca carry water. For years now, I've started my morning washing my face, brushing my teeth, and listening to Robert Hubble. <laughs> Quite frankly, I almost go into withdrawal on Sundays when he's not around, <laughs> and I can't hear his words of wisdom, his pragmatism, and his calm, reassuring voice. A little after breakfast, I read Heather Cox Richardson, I know what you guys do too. And then I boot up my computer to see what Jessica has in store for me that, that day. 10 minutes later, that's all it takes, uh, after a couple of calls, emails, text, whatever she says I need to do, I do it. I shut down my computer and I'm on my way to fight for our country. And with that, I'm honored to turn the mic over to one of our true heroes. Jessica is a community organizer, activist, mom, and elected member of the LA County Democratic Party. She's the author of Chop Wood, Carry Water, which she's published on Substack five days a week since November 2016. She's a delegate to the California Democratic Party, a climate activist, we have a few of them here tonight, and a grassroots volunteer who has knocked on doors, phone banked, fundraised, texted, and postcarded for hundreds of progressive candidates. She's also a political TikTok content creator. She's made it her mission to get regular people more engaged with politics on both a federal and local level. And she hopes she can inspire you to do the same. Jessica and Robert will take questions after they've both spoken. But first, Jessica Craven. So I am Jessica Craven. Um, I'm so incredibly grateful to be here. Donna, thank you. This is amazing. Um, Donna has given me no parameters for speaking, so I'm going to just kind of wing it here. But I just want to say mostly the most important thing is just thank you to every single one of you who is here. Um, 
there are so many things that we can be doing on a Sunday night that are sort of lazy and, um, you know, sort of self-serving. I would be probably watching Netflix or reading my book. Um, and instead, everybody is here. And you came here because you know that there's something bigger than yourself to work for or to worry about. And that's not something that I take for granted after watching what's happened in our country um, and the way Americans have responded to it. So thank you, every single one of you. There are some major, major activism heroes in this group. In fact, probably more of you than not are people who have given more than I have to this cause. We've got the whole Civic Sundays row here. They've been doing get togethers at their houses every Sunday for the whole time. Robert Hubble goes without saying. Uh, we've got Jason Berlin from Field Team 6. Um, we've got Penny, uh, Penny, who's been registering voters and is going back to register voters again in Orange County. Like, there's so many people here, many different Dem Party chairs and, and people who are just doing incredible work. I just met this gentleman, uh, Mr. Myers, who is bringing um, postcards and letters into um, uh, uh, senior citizen residences and encouraging them to to write and this is how we this is how we survive and how we thrive is every person doing their little bit um, and, and I guess I'll just say just in the short amount of time um, I'll tell you why my newsletter is called chop wood carry water and I'm sorry if you already know but it's important um, my dad taught me that phrase in a completely different context. He taught it to me as a survival phrase for when I was going through a tough time in my 30s. I was going through a divorce and I was in so much pain. And I said, when am I ever going to feel better? This feels like it's endless. This feels like I'm never, ever going to get through this. And he said, well, it's going to be bad for a long time. Um, he was very frank. He had been through a couple of divorces. He said, I'm not going to lie. It's going to be tough. But what I'm gonna tell you to do to get through it is that every day you're gonna wake up and you're gonna chop wood, carry water. And I was like, what does that even mean? He said, you're just gonna do the thing in front of you to do. Don't think about when will this be over? How, you know, what, how am I gonna feel in a year still going through this? What can I do today? What are my basic survival actions today? And it, it worked, it worked. I didn't think I was gonna get through that period. And then I thought about that, chop wood, carry water. I did the little basic things every day. And one day I woke up and I thought, oh my God, I got through that. I am in a different place now. And so fast forwarding to Donald Trump getting elected the night of that election, you know, like everybody else, as Jason always says when he talks, I was at the worst election night party of my life. Um, <laughs> crying on, in, in the car on the way home. I mean, we all know how awful it was, right? It was a devastating, devastating night. Probably one of the worst nights of all of our lives forever, right? And a girlfriend called me, she was crying, and she said, uh, what are we gonna do? What are we gonna do? And I was, you know, I was not an activist at that point. I was interested in politics, but I was a presidential election activist, like many of us. And out of my mouth, I just said, I guess we're gonna chop wood, carry water. I don't know, we're gonna have to look for stuff to do. And, uh, and that's what happened is I started looking for stuff to do and then I started sharing it with other people. And then um, more people asked if I could put them on that list and tell them what to do. And I found my calling, which is really funny because I was 48 years old when I figured out what I was put on this earth to do, which was to resist basically, right? So um, I always tell young people like, it might take a while, just keep trudging along there. You might find your calling in your late forties. Um, but what I found as a result of doing something every day was that a couple of things started to happen, but the most important one was that I was able to handle the anxiety. I could manage the fear and the anxiety. Um, whereas just sitting and sort of letting things happen to me, I felt like I could not, I couldn't survive that. That was not going to, I couldn't do that. Um, but what I found is that the people who were doing okay and who were thriving were the people who were doing stuff, the people at Civic Sundays, Jason Berlin, who I met on Neighborhood Council, which we both joined shortly after Trump was elected, people who were just like, okay, wh what do I do? Um, put me in, coach, right? That kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And um, the gift, I suppose, that Donald Trump has given us, if you, you know, that's stretching it a bit, is that we've all, many of us have stood up and said, okay, put me in, coach. I've never paid any attention to this democracy in this country that I live in, but I realized that was a mistake. So what do I do? And uh, I say in my newsletter <clears throat> that hope is in action because what I have found is that I feel hopeless, you know, probably now it's maybe 30% of the time. I feel hopeless, right? 
It doesn't matter. And then a lot of the time I feel like, okay, we're going to be okay. It doesn't matter. What I feel doesn't matter. It is what I do. And when I take hopeful actions, when I call my representatives and tell them how I want them to act, when I do a phone bank or do a canvas or, you know, raise a little money for a candidate or whatever, I find that I have suddenly made myself feel better. And so I have actually become a very hopeful person in the face of what's really a pretty calamitous situation. And that's because I stay really busy. And so as we move into, uh, you know, we've never moved out of a dramatic time. It's been a really, really rough few years. And, and what we're dealing with now is that it's been rough and we're all tired. But <clears throat> this is why uh, you know, stamina. This is why, this is what soldiers, this is what people go through in times of, uh, of extremes. When we are in extremis, we work even when we're tired. And that's what we're called to do right now is that we just have to keep showing up tired or not and do the work. I can feel exhausted and I can still take my small actions. I can know when I need to tap out and take a break. Um, but I still am a absolutely convinced that if every single one of us does a little bit most days not every day but most days a little something um, if we act with more faith than we feel i am positive that we can come through this and that we can actually shape the kind of country that we've never had but that really we are capable of being and so I think the next, you know, 16, 17 months, whatever it is until the election, I guess what I would want to say more than anything is it's going to be very scary. I was saying in my newsletter a couple of days ago, we are living in an era of just maximum noise and minimum certainty, right? We don't know anything. It is so scary to consider who will be the presidential candidate? Who will there be third party candidates? Will people start shooting each other? There's a lot of stuff to be afraid of, right? And for me, my guiding star is always the actions. What can I show up to today to move the needle just a little bit? And uh, I, you know, this week I've been doing phone banking. I've been doing phone banking into Virginia. Um, I've written a few postcards into Virginia. I've done phone banking into New Hampshire because we've got a little state level election there. And that's the other thing I want to say, and I think we've all really learned this, is to pay not just attention to the, the, the big up ballot races, but what's happening down ballot. And I really do believe there is the potential for us to become such better citizens as a result of what we're going through right now. Um, so as much as this is the hardest time I have ever been through in this country, I am grateful for it because it has brought me to all of you, people like you, people like Robert, people, you know, all of you, who are these extraordinary humans who have decided to step up in a moment where it would be easier to hide our head in the sand. And um, I am going to close by saying that I will not give up. I am going to keep acting no matter how hard it gets. It will probably get harder than it is now. Um, but I also believe that as it gets harder, our side will grow, more people will join our team, and I want to remind you that we are acting out of a love of our country and a love for other human beings, right? That is at the ground of what we do. We love, I have an LGBTQ kid, they're amazing, they're 13, I am fighting for my kid and my love for my child and your kids and Bob's kids and grandkids and all of our kids, right? We are acting out of love. The other side, 100% is acting out of fear. And I wanna remind you of that. Every day they are more afraid because there are more indications that they are losing. And so while it is a very scary time, I wanna encourage you to remember, we are acting out of love. They are acting out of fear. Our side will always prevail if we don't quit. So, I like to say don't quit before the miracle. That is a saying that was given to me in a completely different context, but I really, really want to remind you of that. When things get hard, please don't quit. Quit for a day, quit for a week, but come back because the only thing that will defeat us is all of us just giving up and walking away. You have no idea how powerful we are when we stand together, we act out of love, and we remember their fear. And uh, so I, I'm deeply honored to be here. I don't know if any of that was helpful, but I just want to thank you. If nothing else penetrates tonight, we are living through a moment of uh, seismic history. 
everything Maybe no human being in history has lived through a time where we were fighting for democracy here, upon which democracy everywhere else is resting, and the, the planet. That is a lot of stress. So take care of yourselves. Remember to reach out to people you love and let them reach out to you. And then uh, keep taking action with us, even if you feel that you alone are uh, not very powerful. Because remember, and I, this is my last sentence, what I say in my Activism 101 workshops all the time is, every one of us is just a little drop of water, right? We're just bringing our drop to this. Individual drops of water are very, uh, very powerless. They don't do very much, but when you put enough of them together, they can carve stone. And that is what we're called to do. So I just ask you to continue bringing your drop. I thank you for bringing your drop. And now I want to present to you the person who I know you're all here to see, and for good reason, the extraordinary, wonderful, and delightful Robert Hubble. Thank you. So I learned something very important from Jessica's speech. Never agree to speak after her. <laughs> Donna, thank you for inviting us and thank you for being a great hostess. And I just have to say, I'm honored and overwhelmed to be standing before you this evening. Um, you have many things you could be doing this evening. Instead, you chose to be here. And that's significant because in 2015, none of us would have been spending a Sunday evening talking to newsletter writers and making a contribution to helping defend our democracy. Um, my wife couldn't be here because uh, we're splitting, we have our in-laws with us and um, they invited us both out to dinner to thank us for putting them up at our house for the last 10 days. Uh, we learned about this two days ago. <laughs> And we both didn't feel like we could turn down uh, that kind invitation. So she sends her regards. And as I've said in the newsletter, I'm everything I am, it's because of her. So I wish she could be here um, to say hello to you. I'll, I'll give you a little bit of personal insight. Every Sunday, um, we get in our car and we drive to mass and on the way we look at each other and say, why are we still doing this? It's a very hard thing to be a Catholic these days. But today um, the priest came through. I think he scared himself. Uh, he talked about current events. And one of the things he said in his sermon is he quoted Sir Edmund Burke, the Anglo-Irish politician and philosopher who said, the only thing necessary for evil to prevail is for good people to do nothing. And that is a profound statement that we should all take to heart. But it completely misses the point of this moment in time. We need to turn that upside down and say what it takes for good to prevail is for good people to do something. We don't all have to be elected politicians. We don't have to be party leaders. We don't have to have the ability to write a $100,000 check to have dinner with Nancy Pelosi, God bless her. <laughs> we do need good people to do something. 81.2 million people voted for Joe Biden in 2020. If 81 million people did something every week, the future of our democracy would be secure beyond belief. Sadly, not every good person does something. Many people don't do anything. It, it falls on the shoulders of a smaller group of people, you, to do more than your, your fair share for the rest of us. And there's a saying that if enough of us do good, we can save all of us. And that is what you are doing every day 
every night. That's what you're doing tonight. So from the bottom of my heart, as a husband, father, and grandfather, thank you, thank you, thank you. I am honored and in your debt. Thank you. I'm... I apologize for those of you who know the founding story of the newsletter, but I think it's important because it's reinforced every day. Uh, I assured my three adult daughters and, and my wife that Trump would not win. Um, and when he did, um, and this is just between us, <laughs> Uh, you know, one of my daughters had uh, what, you know, would be an emotional break. Um, and Jill and I flew to Washington, D.C. to help stabilize her. Um, we helped her get professional help. We helped her with drugs to help stabilize her. Um, and she was, you know, she said to us, you told us it was going to be okay. And I told you it wasn't. And he won. And I felt responsible in some part for, for giving false assurances to, to my daughter, all of my daughters. And so it was difficult for her uh, in particular, but for all of my daughters to even watch Trump on television, to, to see him, his image, to hear his voice, to hear the lies. And so they began to withdraw from politics. And Jill and I talked about it and we agreed that we understood that, but that wasn't healthy, that they needed to know what was going on. So Jill said, God bless her, why don't you write an email every night to them telling them what happened during the day? And so it'll be, there'll be some distance between what's happened, but they'll know what's happening. So in, uh, Late November, early December, I began to just write a nightly email uh, in the very first week of February 2017. As I was writing it each night, I put today's edition in the subject line of the email, and that just stuck, which is why the newsletter has such a stupid name. <laughs> but it's it stuck, um, and then... Uh, three close family friends knew about the nightly email and said, gee, we're having difficulty processing the news. Can you send it to us? So we did, and they sent it to other friends, and they sent it to other friends. Um, and when it got to, we were sending it to 200 people a night, we looked at each other and said, can you believe it? 200 people a night want to read what we have to say. Uh, this week, um, w uh, the newsletter will pass the 50,000 subscriber mark. And every week, at least one day, we, we have more than 100,000 opens. The newsletter has a very high pass-along rate. And I will say that that's humbling and scary, or it should be, but it's not. Because all I'm doing any night is I'm writing to my daughters and my wife. I'm telling, the same th I'm telling them the same thing that I told them in 2016 and 2017, that it's going to be okay. And I know from hearing from readers every day that many of you still feel that anxiety and that fear, and Jessica alluded to it. You know, what if this happens? What if that happens? And I'm here to say, and this is not a false assurance, I'm here to say it's going to be okay. Democracy is going to prevail. America is bigger than MAGA extremism, and it sure as heck is bigger than Donald Trump. And we're going to make it through this. We may, it may get worse before it gets better, but we are going to prevail. And one of the things that I always try to impress on my daughters is a sense of perspective. I made them memorize the, the, the timeline of the universe. And, and when we get together now for dinner, I say, okay, how old is the universe? 13.8 billion years. How old is the earth? 4.58 billion years. How old is life on earth? 4.3 billion. How old is civilization? 10,000 years. And so things have been very rough for about five years. 
The truth is, we have lived, our nation has lived through more difficult times as a nation. Um, we, the collective we here tonight, have lived privileged lives where we have not had to live in fear that our democracy is at stake. But there are many of our friends and neighbors and co-citizens alive today who lived through Jim Crow and who had to count a jar of jelly beans correctly to have the right to vote, who could have a family member murdered in the middle of Main, Main Street and not get a conviction because an all-white jury let the murderer go free. As bad as it is now for all of us, it has never been that bad, I don't believe, for any of us. I was the managing partner of uh, a law firm, and uh, one of my partners was very rough on other people, and uh, I would get partners and employees come in to me and say, you know, I had this uh, interaction with Joanne and, you know, she did this to me and she did that to me and she said this to me and, and all of these bad things. And I said, well, the first thing I want to ask is, what makes you think you're so special? That's the way she treats everybody. <laughs> and, you know, in that sort of flippant response, I think is the truth, which is an en one of our enemies is that we close in on ourselves. And we think these things are happening to us and to us alone, but they're not. They're happening to a great nation, a nation whose economy is bigger than most of the economies in the world combined, um, a nation that has lived through civil war, a nation that has fought and won two world wars. Yes, times are tough, but in moments of crisis, there are enough of us who care that we're going to prevail. And so if there is anything that you take away from my comments tonight, it is perspective. I've already started to write the newsletter because whenever I go out in the evening, I, I need to get it started earlier in the day so I don't stay up till one or two in the morning. I began to write about 9-11, and I'm writing about the unity that we felt as a nation for a few brief months. And it was a complicated unity because there were all sorts of Islamophobic feelings layered over it. But in terms of just feeling that we were unified as a nation, that part of it was a good thing. And we had that too on January 6th, but for like 30 minutes. <laughs> because by the time that Congress reconvened, the coup plotters in Congress had forgotten the, the, brave, the bravery of the Capitol Police and the people who defended them, and the bravery of Nancy Pelosi, and the bravery of Mike Pence that might have lasted for two or three minutes <laughs> that, that helped us get there. And it was close. It was close in a, in a sense that other things might have happened. But either, even if those other things would have happened, we would have prevailed. We would have survived. I'm confident of that. And I understand this is a scary time. But what I would urge you to do is to know that you're, you're sitting in Donna Jaffe's backyard tonight at a meeting with maybe 100 people. There are thousands, tens of thousands of groups like this across America doing exactly the same thing. There are enough good people doing enough good things to save all of us. Keep doing it. And I, I want to, you know, Jessica touched on a source of anxiety that I want to try to take away from you, and then I'm going to close my comments. Um, this is going to be a hard election. It's going to be close, even though I think when the votes are counted, I think Joe Biden will win by 15 million votes. I think he will have a bigger margin of victory than he did in, t in 2020. But Joe Biden's going to trip over another sandbag. He's going to have 
a moment like any of us could have and people will say, you know, he has dementia. He might get COVID. You know, he might fall off his bike and break a bone. Um, things could get worse. It, it could be very close. But let's just do a thought experiment and then, and then get it out of the way. Let's assume that the Republican nominee wins in 2024. Is that the end of our democracy? Are we that weak? Is, is that all it takes to break 230 years of the greatest democracy ever to have graced the face of the earth? No. If a Republican wins in 2024, we will survive. We will endure. It will be painful. It will take hard work. But never say that that will be the end of, the dem of democracy because it will not be, not if good people like us continue to do good things. So let me just close by saying I am honored that you read the newsletter. I'm humbled that you read the newsletter. And it is my honor to be here tonight with you. Thank you from the bottom of my heart for what you are doing to help make democracy safe for my daughters and my granddaughters. Thank you. So the question is, what if a Republican loses but says they won? And let me take that question to a darker place. Um, which I hear a lot of people say is, is there going to be a civil war? Absolutely not. That's just preposterous. And we need to stop not only talking about that, but we need to stop entertaining those dark fears. Um, yeah, I, I expect that whatever the outcome of the 2024 election, Republicans will say that they won. I also expect that the uh, president of the Senate Kamala Harris will count the ballots correctly. I also expect that the worst Supreme Court we've had in the history of our nation will do what they did in 2020, which is to allow the voice of the people to be heard. So, you know, it, it may not be pretty. It, there may be sporadic violence, but let's not give these men play acting with their guns in the backwoods of Arkansas any more power over us than they have. There will not be a civil war. Uh, you know, I, I saw, um, I love Josh Marshall on Talking Points Memo. Uh, I was very disappointed to see that he published one of these letters from one of his readers who said, oh yeah, you don't think, think there's gonna be a civil war? Come to Oregon or go to Coeur d'Alene, Idaho, where there are people walking around with M16s or whatever they, whatever they are, um, assault AR-15s in the street. You don't think there will be a civil war? And Josh Marshall um, printed that letter. And so I, I, mean, I wanted to write to Josh. I didn't. What, what are those people going to do? Who are they going to shoot? One another? I mean, are they going to go to the center of town square in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho, and take over the courthouse? So what? I mean, it, that's not a civil war. And the whole point of those isolated actions is to instill fear in us. Mm -hmm. And I'm not criticizing your question by any stretch. But they have succeeded because we're all walking around with that little doubt. Well, are they going to allow us to have... I won't say what I'm going to say, but they, you know, they shouldn't have that power over us. Um, we should not ascribe to Republicans and MAGA extremists superpowers they do not have. They are disorganized. They're corrupt. They're shallow. And, you know, uh, they have as much problem with one another as they... They do with us. So don't don't fear them. It's going to be OK. Um, I, I, I have a very strong belief in the courts and uh, also in the Department of Justice. Um, 
and, and for as much as you want to criticize some of the actions of General Milley, uh, I believe that he and the other Joint Chiefs of Staff, or although I think we have a woman Joint Chief of Staff now who's in waiting, will do the same thing. And they say they will say, we're going to stay out of this. This is a civil matter to be to decided by uh, the will of the people. So I'm going to stop talking. Jessica, you take the next question. Okay, I just wanted to say something about that too. For myself, I I, uh, I really try to stay out of the future. I find it's really, really important to not fight battles that haven't been uh, launched yet. You know, we have a lot to do here and now. So um, I heard a great saying yesterday, uh, it's hard by the yard, but by the inch, it's a cinch. You know, <laughs> we we just like inch by inch, you know, like that's next year. Let's yeah. let's let's deal with what we have right now. Virginia, Kentucky, Louisiana, Ohio. There's lots to do, so we'll fight that battle next. That's what I do. That's how I stay sane. Anyway, uh, you you pick someone. The Fourteenth Amendment. Mm. I'm going to let Robert, Robert has very strong opinions about this, but I'm, I am going to say one thing about this and then I'll just let Robert say it, which is that I really, okay, oh yeah, she asked about the 14th Amendment and about the sort of burgeoning movement to get Donald Trump removed from the ballot. And I, Robert has much stronger feelings about it than I do, but I will say that I've had readers writing to me for months and months and months asking me to talk about the 14th Amendment. And I'm very leery of anything that looks like a get out of jail free card, like an easy way to beat Trump. Uh, there are no easy ways to beat Trump because it is not just Trump. So maybe, I don't know, that seems like that's going to unleash a lot of chaos on the country in a lot of different ways. Maybe it's a great avenue, but you guys, we're not going to get rid of Trump MAGA, MAGA-ism that easily. That's going to require all of us to keep working. I, that, that's my feeling about it. Like, I, I, great if it happens, but it probably won't. And we are going to have to beat him at the ballot box, is my feeling. Right. Um, yeah, go. I agree with that. The early iteration of this 14th Amendment disqualification argument said that the secretaries of state just had the free-floating power under the Constitution to um, uh, disqualify Trump without more because it's a self-executing thing. I think that's a very bad idea and theory because it sounds like the independent state legislature theory. Um, I was always in favor of filing lawsuits, which have now been filed in Colorado and will be shortly in other states. But um, I think there are, let me just observe a fact. Two judges have now considered this argument, and both of them have come to the same conclusion. And that is that there is no individual standing to enforce the 14th Amendment, that that is something that is relegated to Congress under Section 5 of the 14th Amendment. Whether that's right or wrong, I'm not going to express um, an opinion because I don't, I don't want Larry Tribe to be madder at me than he already is. <laughs> but I believe that that is the uh, off-ramp that the U.S. Supreme Court will take. It will just say there's no standing here. Section 5 says Congress has to pass enabling legislation. It hasn't done so. Until it does, you're out. So that was a question about how, how do you handle apathy? Um, and, or is it just our burden to bear? I think that, you know, um, so I was PTA president uh, for a couple of years at my kid's school, much against my will. Um, but what, 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 and I was a, a president of the Silver Lake Moms Club before that. I, I say yes stupidly to these things and then I get sucked in. But what I found in both of those situations is that there's always about 10% of people who are doing 
all of the work for the 90% who don't. And I used to get mad about it, and now I just figure, well, thank God the 10% of us are here. And, um, and, and in the end, we will benefit you know, uh, so I don't know. I don't spend a lot of time haranguing people to get involved. I find that to be kind of draining. Um, what I look for are the people who want to help but don't know how. So I would just say, if you're talking to someone who's like, oh, did you see MSNBC last night? I don't even have cable, right? So when I talk to those people, what I will say is I speak from my experience and just say, I have found that taking action has relieved a lot of the anxiety. Mm -hmm. I feel so much lighter because I don't really watch the news. I just do. And if you want to join me, I've got these postcards offering people bite-sized ways to get involved. I put postcards out in bundles on my stoop. I started the newsletter to give people bite-sized ways. People often will do something. They just don't want to go from zero to like, I'm knocking on doors of strangers. But if we offer them bite-sized ways, a lot of people will take us up on that. And, and you know, it's like we take one person at a time and we sort of bring them into this world and then they realize how much better they feel. But if I agonize about the fact that many Americans are doing nothing, I'll just drive myself crazy. You know, it's like, what can I change? What can I not change? So do you want to? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, again, I agree with everything Jessica said. I would just add this. First of all, bless you for being someone who's, who's doing something now. But one thing I think that we have to recognize is that for most Americans, life is hard. Life is a challenge. And they are doing everything they can every day to keep body and soul together, to raise children, to pay the rent, to look for a job, to, you know, to deal with a world that may be telling them that they're not wanted. So I would um, have, you know, not feel resentment, and I'm not saying you do, but just recognize that most people aren't involved because they can't just do one more thing. You know, they're not paying their taxes on time or, you know, they're they're not going over their kids' homework. Life is just harder. And I, you know, I look, I'm not making any judgments about anybody's age here, but let me just say this. I, I have adult daughters and, and I know that life is harder for them than it was for my wife and I growing up. It's just more difficult. The economy's harder. It's more fragmented. They're going to have, instead of five jobs in their career, they're going to have five careers. It's harder for them to own a house. So um, everything Jessica said, everyone should do what they can and, you know, be gentle and kind and accepting. And the, po well, I won't take away uh, Donna's thunder here, but what we have to do is just be open and inviting to people, not, you know, why aren't you doing something, but this is what I'm doing, you know, is there something that, you know, do you want to come and watch, you know, do you, uh, you know, can I have you put one stamp on one postcard? And that, that may be enough. Um, I sh probably shouldn't use this phrase, but I will say that postcarding is like the gateway drug to political <laughs> activism. So if you, if you could get them just even to come to a dessert party at your house, that might be enough. All right, I'm going to set aside Heather Cox Richardson um, for the following reason. I find it very difficult to read her before I write my <laughs> newsletter because either I can't get her voice out of my, I mean, I hear myself in what she writes, and so it's very hard for me to look at that before I write my newsletter. Uh, Josh Marshall, a Talking Points memo, um, I think is, um, you know, when I, I also make it a point to read him last so that it doesn't overly influence what I'm thinking. But he does an editor's blog, uh, you know, it's behind a paywall, but, um, and he's got really great readers who, who make comments. Uh, that to me is the most reliable, spin-free, uh, 
fact-based source of information when it, whenever I have a, a doubt about it. So there you go. Thank you. Every judge's decision that comes down is a positive 80%. What I will say in general is I will always look for places that are not trying to scare me. I don't want to read uh, content that is stirring up anxiety and rage and fear and not offering a solution or a, a, an on-ramp to hope. And that's why Robert has been really, I think, powerful and people are really drawn to him because I get all the news I need. But I also get it, as, as you say, through a lens of hope. But that's not a joke. It's really important because if I become depressed and hopeless, I can't act. Like sometimes I can make myself act and then I feel better. But I would really urge you to be very, very leery of people who are just trying to peddle fear and outrage. That's an industry. And I can tell you as a creator that they'll get more clicks from that than they will from peddling hope. But we can't survive without the hope. So, yes, Sherry. Oh, sorry. Oh, yeah, Sherry, we'll come back to you. Yeah, I think that people ask me this all the time, and I think that there's, it really, to a certain extent, depends on the lawmaker. If you're represented by Ted Cruz, uh, you know, Marjorie Taylor Greene, there's probably, uh, I still encourage people to call, but I'm not really sure that someone like that is, does not care about their constituents. But if you are a lawmaker who is in any way, shape, or form, who is not gerrymandered in a district where they don't have to pay attention, uh, the calls are powerful. And the example I gave to my, my TikTok audience recently is that you guys might be less aware of the Restrict Act, but this is a bill that on TikTok had a seismic uh, impact. People were so worried about it. It was a bill that was going to get rid of TikTok, right? And um, I never saw, I do phone calls to my representatives on TikTok so that people can see what that looks like. And I did a call about the Restrict Act. And it got, you know, hundreds of thousands of views. And I could tell from the responses that people were calling their representatives for the first time ever on, about this bill. And if I don't know if you were paying attention, but again, because I'm on TikTok, I, I know it was going to pass. Like that bill was going to pass. It had bipartisan support. Joe Biden wanted it. It was going. And then all of a sudden, if you notice, a couple of weeks after there was all the talk about it, it just disappeared. It disappeared. And I saw something in Semaphore. I was reading Semaphore the other day and they were like, what happened to the Restrict Act? And what happened is they say that it's, oh, well, there were some, you know, there's little disagreement about the provisions. And then it said, and popular outcry. And popular outcry is powerful when there is enough of it. So I think it does depend on the lawmaker to a certain extent, but, but here's what I say to people. Even if you have the worst lawmaker, if no one is calling them and saying, hey, I want you to be passing pro-choice bills, not anti, you know, not forced birther bills. I want you to be passing gun legislation. They are just going to go off the rails. So in the worst case scenario, we're keeping them from being awful. And in the best case scenario, we are steering their priorities. I have met with Dianne Feinstein's office. I've met with Kamala Harris when she was senator and now Alex Padilla. I've met with my own Congress member. They all tell me the same thing. Oh, yeah. Like, we have to figure out what to prioritize. And so we prioritize what we're getting calls about. Mm -hmm. And the last thing I'll say is, if you think your calls don't matter, let me tell you the other side is calling. Why do we have such a hard time passing gun bills? Because those NRA members call. They call their asses off, excuse my language. And so that is why it is so hard to get that stuff done. And the reason we finally got a gun bill is because people were calling even to the reddest senators and Cynthia Loomis was like, I had to vote for the gun bill because I could not believe the calls I was getting. I was against it, and I changed my vote. So do not think your calls don't matter. They do. They work for you. And anytime you employ someone, you're going to tell them what you want. Otherwise, what are you doing as a boss? So make your calls. Civic Sunday, I, I help run a group called Civic Sundays. Woo! 
few members here. Um, and one of the things one of the things that we do is we run bake sales. And the bake sales, they serve several purposes. One is obviously to raise money for various candidates or causes that are near and dear to our hearts. Um, another is to recruit new members. What I see from the people who come to and literally throw money at us, I mean, we make $2,000 in four hours of selling cookies, seriously. What I see from them is not so much apathy as paralysis. And there is a difference. Um, we spend a lot of time on at those bake sales talking to people and trying to get them to realize that they don't have to be paralyzed, that there are things that are within their reach that they can do. They don't have to come to our meetings. We put them on a mailing list and we send them actions that they can do whenever they find the time. That's powerful. So there are enough people out there who are on our mailing list who do not come to meetings but I know are working anyway. And that's kind of a, it's a silent power that we have behind us. So. I just wanted to correct the record. Apathy is not the biggest problem. The biggest problem is paralysis, which I think is probably fed by fear. So there you have it. We've come full circle. Absolutely. So Civic Sundays has been meeting every single Sunday since right after Trump was elected. And you guys, when I tell you, like, I went to a Civic Sundays meeting right before, I think, was that when Katie Porter spoke? It was like right before the 2020 elections. There were 130 people there. I have a video of it somewhere, just walking around this house, people sitting and writing postcards, phone banking, a whole group of people texting. It is an amazing thing that you can also do. I used to write postcards with three other moms at the park when we took our kids to the park. Like, just find a little group that's also freaking out, and you can go to, come to my newsletter, and I will give you lots of campaigns, lots of postcards, lots of ways to get involved. Write postcards. Everybody loves it. And you will find not only that you will feel better, but you will find a community of other people who are not just sitting down and doing nothing. And it's with Civic Sundays is a miraculous, you should all go and see what they're doing. It's really a very beautiful, powerful thing that will go down in history. Adam Schiff is obsessed with Civic Sundays. Like they're really a powerful group that has done amazing things. So. Right. Okay, we're going to take one last question. Um, I don't have a question. I actually have a comment. So thank you, Donna, very, very much. And your husband back there. Mm -hmm. Right. And I want to shout out to um, Jason Berlin back there. Yeah. yeah. Good. As long as you are not giving up, neither will we. I don't remember if you uh, if you uh, remember the the song that Kate McKinnon sang mm. for Hillary oh, yes. Clinton yeah. on the SNL yeah. right Hallelujah. after uh, last night. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. she was at the piano. She mm -hmm. sang the uh, rendition.
Thank you. Okay, so we're going to wrap things up, but before we do, I want to thank you guys for coming. It's just been a great evening, and Jessica, Robert, what? Okay, I'm going to get to that. Thank you, Johnny. <laughs> so you noticed we didn't make this a fundraiser because we didn't want to have anybody feel obligated. Um, but we did set up a fund, um, Swing Left, Save the save the house and um i will be sending thank yous to all of you personally tomorrow and i'll include the link there also we have the incredible filmmaker with us mr oh my god it's a senior moment john no john and lottie no you're not talking about me, are you? <laughs> Thank you. We have recorded the whole evening, and we're going to put it on YouTube. So all of our members, because we have almost 2,000 Swing Left San Gabriel Valley members, if you can believe it. And I, I think that they're the ones that you were, you were talking about, um, the paralysis. I, I feel that. Um, but I also feel that people are doing things on their own, in their own way. And that's what I love about Swing Left is that there are so many different opportunities. And speaking of which, we have the indomitable um, uh, presence here of uh, Karen Rowinski, <laughs> otherwise known as Ms. Postcard. And she has brought some postcards with her. Uh, what are we writing for? It's Virginia? No, it's actually for Ohio, and we have mostly Field Team 6 postcards, and I have a few left of activating them. Yes. All right. Okay, and then on your seats, there were also a couple of cards. Um, I'd like you to take them home. One is, I commit to remind three friends to vote. So these friends can be not friends, they could be people you've met, like the um, guy who waits on you at Best Buy, who you say, after spending an hour uh, of his time, I'm not gonna buy that unless you register to vote. <laughs> and here's the phone, and you know what? He registered. Um, or the waiter who said he wasn't registered and we're talking and talking and finally the manager comes over and he says, is there a problem? And I say, yes, your employee is not registered to vote. He says, what do you mean you're not registered to vote? Come with me. And he registered him and the next time we went to that restaurant, the waiter was there and he came over, he goes, I voted for the first time, that was so cool. So these are the people you can ask to uh, register, okay? I've got your little cards. And um, there's another card for anybody who wants to um, volunteer. Um, all of you now are supposedly members of SLSGV and you'll be getting uh, the e-blasts, which um, I know that sometimes Jordan and I take turns writing those editorials at the beginning. And of course, I'm inspired so much by these two guys on my left and right. But I try to include to-dos um, and explain why they're important. And Virginia and Ohio are incredibly important. So postcarding, we're going to have an event here um, sometime, I think the end of September. I'll let you know exactly when it is. And we're going to, every week for the whole month of Every week for the month of October, SLSGV will be having postcarding and letter writing events for Ohio and Virginia. So please, if you don't want to come, just let me know. I'll print out letters for you. Karen will get postcards ready for you. So we have a lot to do in preparation for next year. So even though there's nothing huge right now, there are enough little small elections that really make a difference. So um, one last thing. There's a ton of food left. So please fill your plates, take home whatever you'd like. Otherwise, uh, I know someone who's gonna be eating all the leftovers and it's not good for him. So thank you again for coming.